Benjamin Thompson, otherwise known as Count Rumford, was one of the most complex and distinguished men of his time. He was a soldier of fortune, spy, womanizer, and adventurer, but above all, he was a social reformer, inventor, and brilliant scientist. His parentage on both sides came from the original stock of the first English colonists of Massachusetts Bay. He was a direct descendant of the fifth generation from James Thompson, one of the original settlers of Woburn. As early as 1630, and when he was 37 years old, James Thompson accompanied Governor Winthrop, along with 1,500 others, to the New England shores. Along with Henry Baldwin and a few others, Thompson pushed their way to an unknown region and made their homes in Charlestown Village, now known as Woburn. The Count's grandparents were Captain Ebenezer Thompson and Hannah Converse. They built the house in Woburn in 1714. The Count's parents were Ruth Simons and Benjamin Thompson, who were married in 1752, and they went to live with Captain Thompson, and it is there that the future Count Rumford was born on March 26, 1753, in the west end of the strong, substantial farmhouse. In 1755, Benjamin's father died at 26 years old, leaving his widow to raise the little boy along with his grandparents, until his mother remarried Josiah Pierce of Woburn in 1756. They moved a short distance away from the old homestead where Benjamin started his village education from Master John Fowle of Woburn, a well-known Harvard-educated teacher. By the age of 11, he advanced his studies with Mr. Hill of Medford, where he studied higher mathematics, astronomy, and mechanics. Benjamin did not care for the farming life of Woburn, and he showed no skill for it. But what he lacked in farming skills he made up for in sheer intelligence. He was so bright and serious about his studies that at 13 he received an indentured apprentice position as a clerk with a well-known British merchant of Salem, John Appleton. John Appleton, another Harvard graduate, whose family came from England in 1635, owned a very successful retail business in the heart of Salem. Keep in mind, Salem was 15 miles from Woburn, but worlds apart. Woburn was a small farming community where most people were related. Salem was one of the biggest and busiest ports on the New England seacoast. In Woburn, shoes and clothes were bought for durability, not for style. In Salem, style and elegance were much sought after. And it was style and elegance and education that were very important and much sought after by Benjamin Thompson, even at the age of 13. In his clerking position, he was surrounded by a group of adults who were intensely affected by British and colonial politics. With the repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766, Mr. Appleton's retail business never recovered, but he kept Benjamin on where he continued his scientific experiments with gunpowder until it nearly got the better of him. He had a recipe for rockets and firecrackers. There was an explosion and he was badly burned. He had to return to Woven and recuperate at his mother's home. When he recovered, he had to go to work to pay off debts, so in 1769 he went to work for Hope Still Capon in the heart of Boston. He had a dry goods store called the Sign of the Cornfields. The colonial building still stands in a modified form as the old Union Oyster House restaurant. Benjamin lived in the attic of this building, where he continued his studies of Latin, French, and advanced mathematics. In Boston, the excitement of the Revolution was in the air. On the night of March 5, 1770, British soldiers fired into a jeering mob that came to be known as the Boston Massacre. Young Benjamin was not living far from the scene. He armed himself, and he ran to the location, but the mob was dispersing. He had to return to Woburn, and this was a blow to him. Woburn was just too dull. He earned money by cutting firewood on his land and sold it to friends and family. But as fate would have it for Benjamin, living across the road from his farm was Loammy Baldwin. Baldwin was nine years older. He too was village educated. His father was a carpenter and farmer. But they both had brilliant minds and were full of curiosity. An exchange of letters between them started in the 1760s and continued until the end of their lives. Baldwin saved his correspondence between Benjamin and himself and it states that they had many philosophic discussions. They were part of clubs that talked about moral and philosophical questions. Thompson formed a society similar to Benjamin Franklin's Junto for the purpose of scientific dialogue. Benjamin Thompson was 15 and Loammy Baldwin was 24. They attended lectures together on natural philosophy, natural science today, at Harvard College, and did many experiments with electricity. 
Benjamin worked very hard on constructing an electrical machine, but Loami kept telling him it was a waste of time. Benjamin finally agreed and put that idea away. It was during this time that Thompson was living with Dr. Hay of Wuben, and he decided he would take up the study of medicine. But the doctor quickly realized he was more interested in developing mechanical instruments than healing. But it must be noted that Thompson's first recorded scientific observation was a detailed description of a monstrous child born in Wuben in 1771 while working with Dr. Hay. His time with Dr. Hay was more of an educational experience than a preparation for a career. Benjamin Thompson left his medical studies in 1772. He had gained a reputation as an excellent schoolmaster, and he needed money, so when he was offered a position in what is today known as Concord, New Hampshire, by Reverend Timothy Walker, he took it. Concord was a small village half the size of Wuben that ran along the Merrimack River, and was known back then as the village of Rumford. The Reverend Timothy Walker, born in Wuben, was the head of the Concord Parish, and was a very influential man in the town. He had a daughter, Sarah Walker Rolfe. She was married to Colonel Benjamin Rolfe, who was thirty years older than her, and had just died in 1771. They had one child, Paul. She was now a widow of considerable wealth and social standing in New Hampshire. The ambitious Benjamin Thompson, six feet tall, handsome, with bright blue eyes and dark auburn hair, wasted little time getting her attention. Three months after going to Concord, Benjamin proposed to Sarah, and they wed. He was 19, and she was 33. He now had the social and financial connections that he was looking for, and it was through Sarah's father's connections that he met Governor John Wentworth of New Hampshire. Governor Wentworth played a significant role in Benjamin Thompson's efforts to break away from his native background. Wentworth was an American aristocrat. He recognized Thompson's abilities and ambitions, so it was in New Hampshire that Thompson was introduced to intrigue and the art of politics. In 1773, with riots and violent disturbances cropping up all over the colonies, soldiering for the royal governor was a big step. Governor Wentworth gave him a commission as a major in the New Hampshire militia. He was given this commission over officers with more experience, age, and years of service. It made him an object of jealousy and hatred by the officers in his regiment. The consequences of this jealousy and distrust would be felt and affect the rest of his life. In the 1770s, the American Revolution did not start as a revolt. It was Englishmen against Englishmen, a civil war, but not a revolutionary war. Major Thompson had a close association with Tory society. He believed firmly that to be loyal to the British crown, even at his own peril, was in the true interest of his native country. Remember that America's population at this time was approximately two and a half million people, and as John Adams wrote, a third of the population was for the rebel cause, a third was against it, and a third had no opinion. In the fall of 1774, two British deserters were working on Benjamin Thompson's farm in New Hampshire. They soon got tired of farming. The work was too hard. So they came to Thompson and told him they were deserters and asked if he would help them rejoin the regiment. Thompson, knowing General Gage of Boston, asked him for a general's pardon for the two deserters. Otherwise, they faced hanging. The men of Concord found out about Thompson's request, and it was explained to them that it was just a simple act of humanity on Thompson's part. But they had already had the suspicions about his loyalties. Thompson was tipped off that an angry mob was headed to his home. What do we care if the fine young Tory gets his nose broken? Get him. Thompson! Benjamin Thompson! Some true Bostonians are here to have a word with you. Hang the Tory! Thompson! Do you not have the courage to meet us? We only want to give Tommy Gage's lapdog a scratch behind the ears. <laughs> Thompson! Come out, Thompson! He quickly fled to Boston with Timothy Walker, his brother-in-law. He left his wife, infant daughter Sarah, and Reverend Walker to deal with the mob. He had now been labeled a loyalist, Tory Thompson. Major Thompson arrived in Boston at a time when General Gage needed more accurate information about military details in rural districts. Gage had sent out many British soldiers and civilians as spies, but they were not successful, probably due to their accent and not being familiar with local areas. Gage was asking for volunteers. Thompson knew Gage, so he offered his services. Gage knew Thompson had knowledge about military affairs and was familiar with Woburn, Cambridge, Watertown, and Boston. 
he could move freely around and become a trusted messenger between General Gage and his most useful and talented spy, Dr. Benjamin Church, the first Surgeon General of the Continental Army, who was considered an ardent patriot, but was a secret Tory sympathizer. Thompson was much more useful to Gage than just being a messenger from Church. Major Thompson was headquartered in Boston on Hanover Street, just around the corner from Isaiah Thomas, who was a printer and publisher of the revolutionary paper, The Massachusetts Spy. Thompson knew this location was a meeting place of revolutionaries like Paul Revere and Joseph Warren. Thompson moved next door to the print shop and became very familiar with Thomas's wife, Mary Dill. She became a pipeline to secrets of the rebel party for Thompson, giving him information from the meetings being held at their home. This continued for some time until Thompson went to visit his mother in Woburn in April of 1775. He now found himself stranded in Woburn when the struggle began on April 19th. <laughs> Major Thompson knew he was being watched by the local rebels. He turned to secret ink, or as he called it, sympathetic ink. It was his only way to get his messages through to the British. It was an ink made from an infusion of nut galls from oak and other trees, which produce gallotanic acid, a yellow substance that is used in common inks. In May of 1775, an innocent-looking letter, neatly folded into small pieces, passed the sentries of Boston Neck. It never aroused suspicion. The main text of the letter was written with invisible ink, one of the earliest examples from the American Revolution. The letter was written in Woburn by Thompson, who had received military information from a field officer in the rebel army and from a member of the Provincial Congress. These two men were Loami Baldwin and Benjamin Church. In the secret letter, he gave the size of the armies to be raised and the plans to attack the castle, the fort at Castle Island. He also gave the names of two British officers being held prisoner in Woburn. One week after writing the secret letter, Thompson was picked up in Woburn and arrested upon suspicion of being an enemy to the liberties of this country. He was brought before the Woburn Committee of Correspondence and Safety to clear himself of these loyalist charges. One of the committee members was Loami Baldwin. The hearing was held at the meeting house in the first parish in Woburn. Nothing could be proven the court therefore declared they could not condemn him, and he was released, but they refused to give him a full acquittal. While he was restricted in Woburn, Sarah Thompson and their infant daughter, who they call Sally, came to visit Major Thompson. He remained in Woburn for two months, but his personal safety was never far from his mind. To be tied and feathered by the mob because he was an open advocate of the mother country was not an option for him. He never saw his wife again, and it would take 22 years before he saw Sally again. Through all this trouble, Thompson had a staunch and loyal friend, Colonel Loami Baldwin. Baldwin was an ardent patriot and stood by his old friend and fellow scholar. He believed in him, and he protected him from violence. Baldwin even spoke to General Washington, who was now stationed in Cambridge, to ask that Thompson be allowed to serve in the Patriot Army. But Baldwin's request was denied. But Thompson was given the task of helping Harvard College secure their books and instruments so that they could be used in the future and not destroyed during the conflict. But Thompson's choice of allegiance was soon clear enough, for as troop movements on both sides increased and developed into the Battle of Bunker Hill, Loami Baldwin wrote in his diary, Major Thompson went to Woburn. By August of 1775, Major Thompson was letting it be known he was getting ready to leave the country selling off some of his land and settling his debts. But he was still busy with espionage activities behind the American lines, giving detailed reports about Cambridge boat builders to General William Howe, who was just appointed Commander-in-Chief. One of these secret reports was called the Miscellaneous Observations Upon the State of the Rebel Army. In this report, he went into great detail about a typhoid epidemic that broke out in the Cambridge camp. He tells how nobody was allowed to die in camp, all victims were taken home as soon as they became sick. In this way, these men infected their home villages with the result that the whole of New England was suffering. Thompson himself came down with typhoid while in Woburn and was sick until October of 1775. 
Thompson by now was simply not trusted by his fellow townspeople of Auburn. Benjamin Thompson had now made up his mind to leave a country that treated him so badly. He stated, The happy time may soon come when I may return to my family in peace and safety, and when every individual in America may sit down under his own vine and under his own fig tree and have none to make him afraid. He wrote to his father-in-law, Reverend Walker, stating, I am determined to seek for that peace and protection in foreign lands and among strangers which is denied me in my native country. I cannot any longer bear the insult. I have done nothing with any design to injure my countrymen and cannot any longer bear to be treated in this barbarous manner by them. On October 13, 1775, he left Woburn forever, headed to Boston where he met General Howe. He then boarded the British frigate Scarborough and was now headed for England. Upon his arrival in England, Thompson presented himself to Lord George Germain, the Secretary of State for the Colonies. He was carrying letters of recommendation from Governor John Wentworth of New Hampshire and dispatches from General Howe. Lord Germain took a liking to Thompson because of his military knowledge and his knowledge of the Colonies. He appointed him chief intermediary between himself and the American Tory community in London. Many Americans were arriving daily, and the first wave was from New England. Within four years of arriving in England, he was made Under Secretary of State. In spite of his many duties, he spent his free time in London experimenting with guns and gunpowder. In the 18th century, there were no standards for guns and cannons. Thompson carried out 123 experiments in nine days, which produced his first published paper, New Experiments Upon Gunpowder. This established him as a serious scientist and won him a fellowship in the Royal Society of London. He was now 27 years old and had developed a reputation as a natural philosopher. It was during this time that he received word all of his lands in Woburn and Wilmington were confiscated by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The confiscation order stating, He hath fled from his habitation to the enemies of the United States. Perhaps particularly angry over his latest affront, Thompson resigned as Under Secretary of State to take a command in the King's American Dragoons as a lieutenant colonel. He would return to America to fight his former countrymen in 1781, and he was involved in several skirmishes with Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, in Charleston, South Carolina. But most engagements were over by the time of his return. The end of the war was soon at hand, and Treaty of Paris, signed in 1783, officially ended the conflict. He returned to Britain to take on the role of soldier of fortune. He left for Vienna to join the fight against the Turks. He stopped in Strasbourg where he met Prince Maximilian of Bavaria. They quickly became friends and Thompson was invited to Bavaria. In 1783, Germany was not a country as we know it in modern terms, but a loose federation of independent electoral states of the Holy Roman Empire. It was there that he was introduced to the elector of Bavaria, Karl Theodore. He offered Thompson a position in the Bavarian army and his aide-de-camp to the prince. Before he could accept this position, he had to return to England to get King George III's permission, since he was still a servant of the king. Permission was granted along with knighthood. He was now Sir Benjamin Thompson. He spent the next 11 years in Bavaria. When he returned to Bavaria and took up his duties in the army, he realized the army was in total disarray. The common soldiers were mainly conscripted, unwilling, underpaid, and untrained peasants. Thompson, with his energy and strong sense of order, tackled these problems. Some of his sweeping reforms included an increase in pay, schools to educate, military academy for training officers, and he introduced the scientific principles in nutrition. One of these staples was the Rumford soup. Thompson's next round of reforms was aimed at the impoverished population. Bavaria was famous at this time for its high crime rate, hunger, idleness. One out of every 30 people was a beggar or a criminal. Begging, in fact, was a huge problem. Thompson had a drastic plan. On New Year's Day, 1790, Thompson ordered the military to arrest all the beggars they could find in Munich. They were put in a public workhouse. They were not mistreated or treated as inmates, but were trained in a wide variety of skills and then paid on piecework basis. 
Thompson's social experiment was a great success, and many beggars were reabsorbed into society. His successful reforms solidified his popularity with the elector, and Benjamin Thompson was promoted to a Count of the Holy Roman Empire, where he chose the title of Count Rumford, after the small New Hampshire village he left behind 16 years earlier. Another great success of Count Rumford's was the construction of the English gardens that were developed on the swampland near the banks of the Isar River. He was inspired by the Kew Gardens of London. The garden was the finest park in all of Europe when it opened in 1791. It still exists today in Munich. A monument to his achievement was erected in the garden. The people of Munich were forever grateful and wanted to pay the highest tribute to Count Rumford. Count Rumford was an ingenious inventor and a successful scientist. His inventions were practical and useful. During his time in Bavaria, he was working in the fields of lighting, heat, and cooking. His ideas came while working to improve the living conditions of the workhouses by making them more efficient and economical. Eighteenth-century lighting depended on candles or oil lamps. Rumford experimented to find the most economical method of lighting up large workhouses in such. He made a photometer in 1794. He used it to compare one lamp or fuel with another. It led him to design improved lamps known as Rumford lamps. His next interest was in heat. He needed a practical way of keeping people warm. His improvements would be in the design of both fireplaces and chimneys. He would make three main changes. First, he rounded off and narrowed the entrance to the chimney at the bottom, which was called the throat. Second, he made the front openings of the fireplace smaller, reduced in depth, and inclined the sides inwards, providing a quicker flow of air in the fireplace. Third, he introduced a register, now called a damper, so the chimney could be fully closed when the fire wasn't burning. The new design gave out 50 to 60 percent more heat than its predecessor. It quickly became known as the Rumford Stove, and all of London society had to have it. There was competition from across the Atlantic, where Benjamin Franklin's stove was in use. It was significantly different from Rumford's. It had an enclosed fire within a box-like container made of cast iron. It is Rumford's work with chimneys, however, that has lasted the longest, and his basic principles are still in use today. His other important essay was his revolutionary ideas on nutrition and cooking. They were summarized in the document of food, particularly of feeding the poor, written in 1796. The existing method of cooking food was over an open fire, very inefficient. Rumford changed that and it developed the basis of modern methods by cooking on an embryotic kitchen range. The Rumford range had 12 separate fireplaces built as vertical holes into a brick structure. They held special pots, pans, and kettles. The Rumford roaster was designed for cooking meat, roasting it slowly by hot air the world's first convection oven. He also produced a cookbook of recipes, particularly of foods suitable for the poor, using cheap materials such as macaroni, barley and rye, and of course the potato. Count Rumford achieved great administrative and scientific success on the continent. He became a household name, and it preceded him wherever he went. He was at the peak of his fame and found himself among the intellectual and social elite of society. Sally arrived in Bavaria in 1796. She was 21 years old, her mother had just died, and she was going to try and develop a relationship with her estranged father. It wasn't easy. Rumford was very domineering and opinionated. When he first met Sally, after over 20 years of not being in her life, he was appalled by her small town, New England ways, and what he considered her lack of education. He was a man with a great ego and considered himself to be very cultured. He spoke several languages, loved music, and had been in the presence of kings and queens. He wanted her to be an ornament to society. He quickly sent her off to a fashionable girls' school outside of London. After all, she kept curtsying to the servants, and that just wouldn't do. The political situation in Bavaria was getting worse. Napoleon was rearranging the map of Europe. But it was during this time in Munich that Rumford made his most important scientific discovery, thermodynamics 
the theory of heat. At this time, it was widely believed that heat is a fluid form of matter. Totally by accident, while he was boring cannons, Rumpfen discovered that more heat was released than could possibly have been contained in the metal. He concluded that the process of boring produced the heat and that the heat should be considered a form of motion. He later applied this understanding of heat when improving the fireplace and chimney. Rumford decided to return to London in 1798. When he arrived, he learned he was out of favor with King George. The king had denied his request to be appointed Bavarian minister to the court of St. James. The king considered him a British subject, and Rumford could not represent a foreign country. Rumford found himself stranded in London without a job and deeply depressed. Sarah had been pressuring her father to pay a visit to America, and he seriously considered it. He wrote a letter to Loami Baldwin asking him to purchase land and a house in Cambridge, because he had the romantic notion he would retire in the role of a German nobleman with no political affiliations. Word got back to John Adams, who was now President of the United States, that Rumford was coming to America. He authorized Rufus King, American ambassador to London, to ask Count Rumford if he would establish the American Military Academy, West Point. It was well known in America that Rumford had the military model for organization and weapons that was used in Bavaria. Rumford had previously been in direct contact with John Adams when Adams was president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. But Rumford was concerned over how he would be treated if he returned, given the events of war. Adams reassured him, however, that he would be well received in America now that the passions of war had cooled down and they needed his expertise. But upon long reflection, Rumford decided to refuse the opportunity, and this decision was now the end of an era for Count Rumford. He always considered his profession to be that of a military man for 25 years, and now he turned away from it. He sent his entire military library, papers, and models to America. Rumford always held the idea of forming in London a public institution for diffusing knowledge. In 1799, Rumford's institution would become the Royal Institution of Great Britain. Today, it is one of the leading scientific institutions in the world. At this same time, Sally returned to America, and the Count turned his energies to this new project. Rumford lived his life by the rule of order, and that is the approach he took to this institution. He raised the money, bought the building, and partnered with Sir Joseph Banks, who was the president of the Royal Society at this time. He supervised the installation of exhibits, lecture halls, laboratories, and libraries. He recruited young scientists, notably Humphrey Davy, who later would discover sodium and potassium. The institution thrived, but Rumford irritated people with his bombastic style and soon alienated his staff. By 1801, he left the institution and headed for Paris. In Paris, Rumford was acclaimed by Napoleon in the entire French scientific community. He was elected to the French Academy, only the second American to be accorded that honor, Thomas Jefferson being the first. It was in Paris that he met and fell in love with Madame Marie Anne Lavoisier. She was the widow of the famed chemist Antoine Lavoisier, considered the father of modern chemistry. He had been guillotined in 1794, along with her father, by French revolutionaries. Madame Lavoisier was scientifically literate from having worked alongside her husband, helping write his papers and documents. Count Rumford and Marie seemed made for each other, so they bought a home in Paris with her money and were married in 1805. During this time, Rumford continued his experiments and inventions. He worked on directional thermometers which could be pointed at radiating sources, his most famous thermometer was a double ear thermometer, which he called a thermoscope. The Count wrote to his daughter to tell her of his marriage. He referred to Marie as the incarnation of goodness. But the relationship quickly soured. By the first anniversary, he referred to her as that woman. By the third year, she was a female dragon. The mismatch between Rumford and Lavoisier became more evident. It was not one-sided. According to Marie, the Count was a boar. He became more eccentric, and he had concluded that in winter one should wear shiny white clothing to keep from losing body heat. But he started dressing in white every day, including a white shiny hat. She was strong-willed, rude, and steeped in the fame of her first husband. 
Their relationship was a very public and somewhat of a joke in Parisian society. They divorced in 1809. The strain under which Rumford had been living caught up with him. He was ill for three months. He decided to settle down in a rented villa in Otoy, France. He asked Sally to return and live with him. Upon her arrival, she notified the Count that his dear friend, Loami Baldwin, had died in 1807, but that the Count's mother was still alive and doing well. During this period, he continued working in the field of light and the art of coffee-making, which he had been working on for 15 years. As far as drinks were concerned, Rumford was partial to Burton Ale, but he was a passionate advocate of coffee, as most of society was. He claimed that sweetened coffee was both wholesome and nourishing. He even suggested it would be a substitute for alcohol, for the poor. He made designs for many types of coffee makers, including a portable maker and a drip coffee maker. While living with Sally in Otoy, France, Rumford started a relationship with Bitois Lefebvre. She bore him a son, Charles, born in 1813. Sally wasn't very happy, to say the least. She realized her father no longer needed her help and left to travel through other parts of Europe. Strangely, as the years passed, Sally grew to like her half-brother Charles, who married, joined the French army, and died during the Crimean War. It should be mentioned now that Count Rumford had quite a reputation over the years as a womanizer. At one point during his time in Bavaria, he had relationships with two sisters, the Countess Baumgarten, whom he had a daughter with, Sophia, and Countess Nogarola. There was also Lady Palmerston, who was his confidant and companion for many years. In 1814, Napoleon's empire was crumbling. The siege of Paris was imminent. Sarah was in Switzerland. Count Rumford dies suddenly of what was called a nervous fever on August 21st, 1814. He was 61 years old. Only a handful of people gathered at the graveside in the small cemetery in Otoy. Benjamin Delassere gave a brief eulogy. By the terms of his last will and testament, witnessed incidentally by the Marquis de Lafayette, the Count sent the vast bulk of his estate back to the country of his birth, leaving sizable bequests to the United States Military Academy at West Point, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and to Harvard University. Through those bequests, the brilliance and the legacy of the Count live on when the endowed Rumford professorship in the Science Department of Harvard, and the Rumford Medal, given every two years by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences for cutting-edge work in the area of heat and light. He was, when all is said and done, a great mind of his day, and his was a mind where great thoughts were not confined to one particular field of interest, but rather they were cut across a diverse and wide-ranging swath of human interests. Well over a century after his death, he would be aptly described by none less than President Franklin Roosevelt as a many-sided man. Indeed, the Count would be specifically placed by Roosevelt in the same category of such many-sided men as Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and Napoleon. Benjamin Thompson, the Count of Rumford, many-sided indeed, soldier, teacher, Tory, spy, able administrator, scientist extraordinaire, thinker, and lifelong learner, and, lest we forget, Wubernite. It would take many years before local residents would recognize the achievements in social reform and scientific discoveries that earned a local boy named Benjamin Thompson worldwide fame as Count Rumford. He was treated and honored as a local hero, not in Wuben, but in Munich, Germany, where a twice life-size bronze statue stands on Maximilian Strauss, one of Munich's grandest avenues. The inscription reads, Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford, born in Wuben, Massachusetts erected 1867 by Maximilian II, King of Bavaria. A donation by Wuben resident Marshal Tidd would help raise the awareness of this local boy when an imposing duplicate of the Munich statue was placed in front of the Wuben Public Library in 1900. 
But before that statue was raised, in March of 1877, influential citizens of Woburn that included Marshall Tidd, John Cummings, and Charles Choate formed the Rumford Historical Association. As stated in their charter, it was for the purpose of ownership of the house in which the Count was born, and for the purpose of establishing and maintaining a museum, library, and reading room, and advancing the useful arts and sciences by lectures or otherwise. The organization still exists today under the leadership of President Len Harmon, and the association still owns the Count Rumford birthplace, located at 90 Elm Street. It maintains the home for historical and museum purposes. In April of this year, the Woman Historic District Commission, the Rumford Association, and Department of Public Works joined forces to begin repairs on the Rumford birthplace. Through the volunteer efforts by members of the Historic District Commission, the work began by preparing the inside of the house for painting. The furniture, paintings, and artifacts were wrapped, boxed, and moved. That goes in the middle, and then we'll put some chairs around it. How's that? Spin the yarn. <laughs> I'm just going to get it away from here, Jack, because I got to paint. And I got everything out of here. I just have to do this cabinet here, but we don't have any paper. So just be careful. Just take this one out. Take this one out. Take this one out. This does too. I think it's just the frame. You want to leave that work stuff in here? The interior painting and repair work was done by the Department of Public Works, and as the summer progressed, they started the outside repairs by scraping paint and replacing boards. Work was also completed to the windows and chimney. The restoration of the signs was completed by Len Harmon and Mark Gaffney. Finally, the task of reassembling the rooms and arranging the displays was artfully done by Diane and Len Harmon with the assistance of Ann Anderson. The Count Rumford Home is a National Historic Landmark, listed on the National Register of Historic Homes. It is one of Wuben's treasures to be enjoyed by all and preserve for future generations. On October 31st, 2009, a reopening ceremony for the Rumford birthplace took place. I'd like to welcome all you folks to the reopening of the Count Rumford birthplace. And I'd like to call on the mayor to cut the ribbon if he would. Be happy to. You let me know when you're ready. Yes? Yeah. As visitors enter the home, they will be able to appreciate the care and preparations that went into the reopening.
I am certain that the founders of the Rumford Historical Association would be very pleased and proud to see the keepers of the Rumford flame continue their work.